Good evening, Pastor Mark here for Brand Naz, the, the Brantford Church of the Nazarene. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening for our midweek Bible study as we are looking at some of the images, some of the word pictures of God and seeing what he is like in his personal way. Uh, I'm, as I have typically done at the start of the study, I'll just wait a few minutes for others to log on, um, but just to give you some uh, instruction as well as we do this. I would encourage you to, if you can, to, to take a Bible. It dawned on me last week when I said to a number of you, well, look at this verse or look at that verse, that you didn't have a clue what I was talking about because you were using your digital device, whether it be a tablet or a phone, and that's where your Bible is too, and you couldn't do both at once. So if, you, if you've got a, a real paper Bible, I would encourage you to get it uh, and, and use that, but if you don't, that's, that's okay as well. I'll try to remember to read the verses as much as possible. And as well, in the comments section, I believe at the bottom of your screen there, you can add comments as we go through the study. I might add the, ask the odd question. Uh, I can't see uh, what you're posting, but others can. And so it can be an encouragement to them and uh, help them. Uh, I can't answer any questions you would have on there, but I can pick those questions up afterwards. So just uh, feel free to put in comments there to interact with each other. Uh, I may ask some uh, rhetorical or reflective questions and you can answer me. You can uh, just contemplate and think about those as well. So we'll just leave it just another half a minute more for more people to come on. But as you're, as you're getting ready, I would encourage you to take a Bible and open it to the Old Testament book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah is just past or about the halfway mark of the Bible in pages. You'll find it there. Uh, past the Psalms and Proverbs and those books. And then you're going to come to the, the major prophets or the, and the book of Isaiah chapter 5. We're going to be considering the first seven verses tonight as we consider the image of God the picture of God, the word picture of God as God as a vineyard owner. Might sound a little different thinking of God as a vineyard owner, but uh, it's an, um, a, an illustration that would be very familiar to the people of the day. Uh, people in the New Testament days, people in the Old Testament days, vineyards were very common and vineyard owners or vineyard keepers were well known to people. And so a lot of this, this these word pictures that we're going to find painted in these seven verses that we're going to find here are going to uh, would be uh, images that these people would be more than familiar with. They would picture that happening and understand that happening. So let's uh, just begin our time this evening and I will uh, just offer a prayer, have a, a little time of prayer here as we come before the Word of God. Join your hearts of mine in prayer. Father, as we come to your word, the Bible that you have given to us, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. I pray that you would uh, uh, reveal yourself in it, Lord. But not only just reveal yourself, I pray that you would uh, reveal to us ourselves and how those two come together, how you want to relate in our lives, how you want to work in our lives, how you want to see fruit come from our lives. I pray this evening, Father, that you would speak to us and speak to us clearly through your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Think of a time or imagine a time, reflect on a time when you, when you invested your resources in something or someone else only to have it fail, only to have it not turn out like you expected. You've invested time, you've invested energy, you probably invested uh, resources uh, of some sort, whether you material things, money or whatever, you've invested it into something or into someone and it has failed. It, it hasn't come out as you expected it to. How are you feeling? What are some of the, the, the thoughts and emotions that you went through when that happened? You had invested yourself into it and it, I guess there's better, no better way to put it than it flopped. It flopped like that. How, how, how are you feeling? When we invest our time and we invest our energy, particularly into other people, uh, with that, what do we expect in return? Uh, just a simple thanks, 
We expect nothing. Uh, do we expect visible results in the person's lives? When we invest into them, are we expecting to see something back from them that says, hey, it was worth spending time. I see a change in this person. It was worth spending time with them. It was worth putting the, the effort into that, being with them for that. Here's maybe even a more uh, tough question or a more personal question. Over the years, if it's been years, what fruit has the Lord produced in your life that would show that you've trusted in Him? Over the years, what fruit or what evidence, what proof, if I can put it that way, has been shown in your life of the kind of fruit that the Lord has produced, of how you've responded to Him? What would be the evidence of that? What are the indications in your own life that there's been fruit produced? You don't necessarily have to type those thoughts and comments in the comment section. Some of us are familiar with the vineyard, uh, if for nothing else, to, to drive by them. Uh, particularly those of us who live in the southern Ontario uh, area and in the, the, the Niagara Belt. There's a lot of vineyards, a number of vineyards that we see there. What does a vineyard owner expect as a result of his labors. What does a vineyard owner expect as a result of his labors? He puts in all that labor, what does he expect? He's going to expect some fruit. He's going to expect some, uh, when you think of a vineyard, we automatically think of grapes. He's going to expect some grapes, some, some fruits with that. But we have to understand there's a tremendous amount of work that goes into that. Uh, Lorreen and I have good friends in Niagara Falls, Ontario. Uh, his mother, our friend's mother and father used to, or stepfather, used to own a vineyard. And we can just think, oh well, in the spring the vines start to grow and then you harvest it in the fall, you're done. But it was a year-round task that they had, keeping the vineyard to produce the fruit that they wanted at the end of the, uh, the harvest season, to get that fruit. It was a year-round task. It was a highly labor-intensive uh, endeavor, uh, highly dependent upon the weather, highly, highly dependent on many things that they had to pour themselves into for that. Well, in, in both the, the New Testament and in the Old Testament, God's people are pictured as a vineyard. And in Isaiah chapter 5, the first seven verses in particular, we see that image there. We see an example of that, of how God's people are pictured as a vineyard. So I'm going to read that for us from Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 to 7. The words of Isaiah 5, 1 to 7. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers of Jerusalem and you people of Israel, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard that I have not done for it? When I looked for grapes, why did, I, why did it yield only bad? Now I tell you what I am going to do with the vineyard. I will take away this hedge and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, the people of Judah, and the, are the vines that he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed. For righteousness, he heard cries of distress. Just pray with me. Father, as we look at your word now, speak to us through these words. Teach us what you want to teach us through this. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What is something you have done in life that has taken a, a long time? Something you've done in life, a task maybe, 
uh, something you accomplished. Uh, maybe it was getting a degree at school. Uh, maybe it was building something. Um, it could be any one of a number of things. What's something that you've spent a long time, something that you took a long time and put a lot of effort into? Well, from this initial reading of what I just read from Isaiah 5, 1 to 7, we, we, we see in, in here the relationship between God and what he calls his, his vineyard. Uh, the vineyard owner put a lot of work into this. And, and when it didn't produce fruit, he got ticked. He was upset. He wasn't happy with this at all. And maybe that is even, to put it mildly, when that happened. We, we see there in verse uh, 2, the end of verse 2, he then looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Verse 4, the end of verse 4, when I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? How does the vineyard owner feel then? He's done all this work, poured all this energy into it, uh, gone through all this effort, and he goes for the fruit, and it's bad. It's spoiled. An uh, image I form in my mind is not a fruit, but have you ever poured a glass of milk and tasted it, and about one and a half swallows in, you realize this is sour. You, you just want to spew it out and you can't get rid of that taste. Just what a disappointment. You were looking for a nice, refreshing glass of milk and it's sour. It's turned on you. Uh, disappointment that you have in that. Well, the vineyard here, owner here, who, who is God, he looks upon his vineyard and he sees the fruit, expecting to see or hoping or desiring to see good fruit. And he sees fruit that is described here as only bad fruit. Why did it yield only bad? that it had there. What are the marks of a fruitful life for God? When God works in our life, what are the marks of a fruitful life? Well, to, to, to look at a portion of that at least, I want us to turn to the New Testament, open a Bible to the New Testament book of Galatians. Galatians, if we can turn to the New Testament book of Galatians, And we are going to see in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. We're going to see what some of this fruit is. If, if God is planting a vineyard and we're his vineyard, and he looks for fruit, I think it's a good indication when we see in the Bible of when it describes fruit. His, God lives in us with the Spirit of Christ living within us. He dwells within us. And so the fruit that's supposed to come out of that is this. Uh, listen as I read for us, and if you've got a Bible and you're looking at it, follow along with us. But in verse 22, it says there, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That forbearance, in other words, is some translations or some versions of the Bible use is patience there. So these are the fruit fruit of what God desires from his vineyard. When we see fruit, we, we see it there. Practically speaking, though, what does that look like when we see these things worked out of our lives, come, come flowing from our lives? Is, if it's coming from us, it's fruit coming from there. There's love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. What do those look like? What, what's a picture of that? Well, I would suggest to us this evening that a picture of that is Jesus. That's what Jesus looks like. When we come to God through Jesus Christ, He fills us with His Spirit. And He begins that process within us, that sanctification process, to conform us more into the image that He sees us as through Christ. Through Christ, He sees us as fully righteous. But through the Spirit, he starts to conform us more to that righteousness. He looks at us, if I can say, through the lens of Jesus to see us as righteous. But then he conforms us more to that image as we grow in our faith. That's the vineyard work. That's the producing of the fruit. If we see this fruit being worked out, we're going to see that. Now, here's a pet peeve of mine. A pet peeve of mine is when I hear people say the fruits of the Spirit. 
Look at what it says there. It doesn't say fruits of the Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit. Not fruits, but fruit. It's not like a fruit basket that we get to pick and choose what we want. And there, oh, I'll have one of these little cherries, and I'll have one of those little grapes, and I'll have an apple, or I'll have an orange, or no, I don't want a banana, or I don't want a, a kiwi fruit, or something like that. No, it's all together. This love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control, it's all together. And we're to be growing in all those areas, because those areas, those that fruit, is ultimately manifested in Jesus himself. It's manifested in Jesus. N note the efforts that the vineyard keeper put into this work. Uh, back, to, Let's go back to Ephesians, uh, sorry, Isaiah chapter 5. And, and note the effort that the vineyard keeper put into this work. In chapter 5 of Isaiah, the first two verses... I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile field. It's a fertile, sorry, a fertile hillside, it says there. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. So he, he does these things. It says he dug it up. He tilled the soil. He moved the soil. He broke the soil so that it could bear both the seeds and bear the moisture that was needed within that. He cleared it of the stones. He got rid of the rubble that was around it. He, he cleared that stuff out. It says he planted it with the choicest vines. The vineyard keeper here, God, he doesn't just throw any old plant in. He just puts the choicest plants in. I've had a general theory or, or practice in my life that whenever you buy, a, say, a tool or you're, you're purchasing anything, purchase the best one you can. Now, don't get me wrong, don't misunderstand what I, I'm saying here. I'm not saying purchase the most expensive thing. Now, probably because the most expensive thing isn't always the best thing, but it, purchase the best thing you can. And I illustrate it this way. If you've got $10 to spend on something, spend the $10 on it and get the best one you can. Don't spend $5 on it and say, oh, I'll take it easy and, uh, and I, I won't get the best one I can. Uh, I've made that mistake enough times, particularly if it comes to tools or something, I've realized Spend what you can on the tools. I've n not been able to always afford the best tool, but I get the best tool I can. So here he says here, when he has uh, planted it here, he says with the choicest vines, he's taken what he desires to be the best. That's going to be the best. It says here, when he, tilled up the, he dug up the soil, he, the, he uh, planted it with the choicest vines, he built a watchtower. He built a watchtower to make sure to keep thieves away, uh, to keep uh, potential destructive animals away, to do that. So he built a watchtower to see that he, he wants to protect it. He, he, he cut out a wine press as well. He's doing the whole show, right from the beginning, getting the soil ready, right to the harvest time of getting the wine press ready to do that. So he, he's looking after it all. And we are his vineyard, not only because he loves us, but because he's prepared us. It says there, I will sing for the one I love. He loves us. Yes, yes. But not only just because he loves us, but because of what he's invested into us as well. We are his vineyard because of what he has poured into us. Preparing can be a, a painful process. When we look at this digging up and we look at this clearing of the stones, even in our own lives, when we see some, some turning of the soil, some, some tilling of the soil, some fouling of the soil, when we, when we see some stones being removed, that can be a, a, a hurtful process, that could be a difficult process, but he's done it for the best, he's, he's, he's done it for what he needs to. Uh, but look at the disappointing results, as I've already referred to at the end of uh, verse 2 there. But when he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. And then verse 4, but it looked, I looked for good grapes, but it yielded only bad. The results of what he had there. What a disappointment. What a disappointment. Uh, several years ago in the uh, 1990s, uh, our family lived in Saskatchewan. And there was a lot of cattle ranchers and a, and a number of grain farmers there. In fact, we had one, one family in the church that they, they, they farmed, grain, grain farming, they farmed close to uh, I think 12 to 15,000 acres. 
Now, they didn't always seed that every year, the full amount. They had to follow some of that and lay it over to, to replenish the soil. But I think it was typically nine to 10,000 acres that they farmed. What a disappointment to have had put all the work into that and get something back that's bad, that's not going to work. But, but what does bad fruit look like? We, we looked a moment ago of what the fruit of God is, what he desires for us. Well, let's go back there to Galatians chapter 5. And just before the portion that I read for us a few moments ago, there's another portion there that gives, an, gives us an indication of what bad fruit looks like, of what, what we see when we see that. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21 that we see here. Read immediately before what I said. Let me read that for us. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy. Drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So we see uh, many of these manifestations of what bad fruit is. These are the things that are there. Now, I can look at this list, and uh, many of these things I could look at as, oh, I'm not involved in that. That's okay. Put it aside. But then we begin to look at some of those, and one word that catches my eye here when it says factions, envy, can very many, if any of us, say, no, that's never been something that's got, got me. I've never been envious. I've never caused dissension or spoke ill of anybody else that could cause a division or, or discord like that. I think when we look at these things and we see these things, we see these things are not of God. He desires to pl replace those things with the fruit of the Spirit. The love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. He wants to have that manifested in our life. He wants that to be the fruit of our life as it works out there. Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 5. Look at how the vineyard owner, or I'll read for us if you don't have a Bible there, how the, how the vineyard owner responds here when he sees bad fruit. Now I will tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge. The hedge was around the outside of it, protecting it from elements and things like that. And it will be destroyed. Not the hedge, but the vineyard will be destroyed. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled. Nothing, no barriers protecting it for, for wild animals or people who can run through them. They can just trample them. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated. And briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. I think of the New Testament book of Matthew and the Sermon on the Mount of Jesus and when he declared in there that the, the rains rain on the fields of the righteous and the unrighteous. And yet here we see where God is saying for, for his people who have not responded the way he wants, his vineyard, who have acted contrary to what he wants, he is going to dry up those clouds. That's how upset he is over this. That's how he responds to that. That's how disappointed he is with this. When he looks at that, he says, I will dry up the clouds. Verse 7. Note who the vineyard is. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. We are God's people when we've come to him through Jesus Christ. So these verses that we find here aren't about some enemy of God's. They are about his people. When he sees them here. And he, he, he responds to them. He says, this is so awful to me. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to wipe them out. What, what's your response to how strong God responds here? I will make it a wasteland. Wasteland. I will break down its wall. I will take away its hedge. And the, the various things that he says there. Shocked. Or maybe we say, that, well, they deserved it. Maybe some of us might say, well, don't they get another chance? We see God's response here. But we also know 
For whose is the fruit of the vineyard intended for? What is that fruit for? Is it for each other? Or what is that for? When we look at verse 7, we see and read, The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, the people of Judah. Are the vines he delighted in? vines are for him. He delights in those vines. And that's what those vines are for, for him. Uh, it says there that others look for justice and righteousness or for righteousness uh, and he, he, he looked for and he looked for justice but saw bloodshed for righteousness but heard cries of distress. He was looking for these things. Where do we find ultimate justice? Where do we find ultimate righteousness? I would suggest to us we, we find the ultimate righteousness, the ultimate justice or in Jesus. Through his son, Jesus. We find that justice. We find that righteousness. God demands justice. He will be a good, uh, he is a just God. He demands justice. But he's poured that on Jesus. He demands righteousness. But that comes through Jesus and comes to us. Can you think of a, a fruit in, in your life that the Lord has produced in your life? What's some fruit that he's produced in your life? Some, some, we, we see the love, joy, patience, patience, but how, how has that expressed itself? How has that shown itself? It said, well, I've got love, I've got this, I've got it, but how has it shown itself to have that? What were some of the steps in that fruit bearing process? If it was something that we thought of that produced love, if it was something in, 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 that we thought of that produced patience, how, how was that fruit bearing process? The one that gets me often is that the, the, the portion of the fruit is patience. Uh, I haven't always been the most patient person in the world. And someone once said, well, be careful if you pray for patience because there's only one way that God's going to show you whether you have that patience, and that's to put you in a, in a situation where it's going to have to be expressed. So be careful what you pray for. And I would say that with any of the fruit. Love, joy, be careful what you pray for, because you're going to be in one of those situations to say, yes, this fruit is evident to do that. But when we think of some of the steps, or some of the process, some of those situations that God has brought us into, that God has uh, taken us through, to show that the developing of that, the, the vineyard being in process. What's maybe, time to reflect for a moment just on a, on a thought of, what's maybe some of the, the, the not so good or the bad fruit that you've seen in your life that maybe God, could we, could we deal with this? Some of the bad fruit. Some of the bad fruit that needs uh, taking away. Some pruning in our lives that need to be done. Uh, you know, New Testament illustration of what oh, Jesus declares about the vine and the branches, I am the vine and you are the branches. And, and it talks here about pruning and we think of those things. And we think of the, what, what needs to be done to do that. And, and when, you, when you're a vin, vineyard keeper, you realize how much it takes to prune. Uh, I'm always amazed when I drive by vineyards in the winter when there's not, not much snow covering and you can see. And those beautiful vines that have grown over the summer and into the fall, are chopped almost right down to the ground. Uh, once they start to grow, the bad parts of that vine being uh, cut off, being hacked off, because they're going to take away from the growth of the fruit that's needed, the, the things that needed to be taken away within that. This is all part of the work that God does for us as a vineyard keeper. He is a personal God who desires to have personal relationship with us. And one of these ways that we see it is a vineyard keeper working in our life, digging up the soil, clearing out the stones, planting the choice of the vine, working in our life, seeking to see good fruit from that. The question is, will we respond to him? Let me pray now and join your hearts with mine in prayer. Father, I wish it was just as easy as Succumbing to you and almost laying back, complete surrender, flopping on the ground. Totally, uh, no tense muscles, no nothing, just flopping and let you mold us the way you want it. But you've called us to participate in this with you, to work through us, to live out this fruit that you desire in us. 
And so, so Lord God, through the power of your Spirit, I pray that you would work in and through our lives that this fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, would be seen in and through us to impact others and to be for your delight and your praise and your honor. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.